Hey there, and welcome to You Talk. We highlight stories from across Canada, the diverse cultures and communities living here, and organizations and individuals that help make life the best can be. I'm your host, Ryan Funk. A designer, educator, story crafter, and photography enthusiast, Shagun Alude is a man of many hats, but his primary focus is graphic design. Having been in the industry for many years, he has a profound understanding of the artistic world. We discuss art, teaching, and social issues on this episode of You Talk. I'm Shagun Alude. And I sort of wear many hats, but one at a time. <laughs> as um, some people would actually know me as a university lecturer because I taught graphic design for 11 years at the University of Manitoba. Some people might know me as a storyteller because I wrote a book on my indigenous language, Yoruba, which is from southwest Nigeria. And some will know me as a graphic designer. And I've done anything from brochures, being part of a team that designed stamps for Canada Post. I've done several corporate identities. Um, I can go on, you know, websites, whatever, everything that the graphic designer does. So those are three major areas of my personality. But there's also one where every year, my wife and I go to Nigeria to the rural areas to teach leaders and community um, involved individuals and youth about how to um, engage in their own development of their own communities so that they don't just sit and wait for assistance that's not coming. So those are the major areas apart from, you know, Right now, I'm working as a graphic designer for an international ING, uh, NGO that works in 47 countries. So that's pretty much who I am and what I do. Yeah, so you're uh, you're a very uh, busy individual. <laughs> Indeed. Gives me out of trouble. Uh, I know a couple of people who just kind of like wear all those uh, different hats and put, always wanting to put a new feather in their cap. And they're always on the move, and it's it's always exciting to see uh, what they're up to next. Uh, in terms of graphic design, what first uh, attracted you to that? Well, um, I think it's something that grew out of a childhood love for drawing. You know, I grew up in Africa, where in my very first years. We lived in a house that, you know, had a lot of sand around it, you know, sand because everything was so fresh at that time. And I would always sit outside and draw chicken and draw cars and anything in the sand. And then one day my dad got tired of that and got me a pad of paper and pencils. And I'm talking like at age four. So that was like heaven to me. And from then I just drew and drew. And of course, through school, drawing and art became my major love subjects. And from there, I ended up in a, an institution called Yaba College of Technology in Nigeria to do fine art. And I would have thought I'd come out as a painter. But once I knew about graphic design, that was it. Something that was practical, something that could look at problems and resolve. Um, it just grew from there. And that way led to coming over to University of Manitoba to do a four-year honors course in graphic design. And of course, um, from there, it went on to two masters and <laughs> teaching graphic design, working as graphic design. It just seems like that's the only thing that I know. <laughs> when someone has that passion, like regardless of the medium they have to work with, you, it's always impressive to see what uh, people can do. There is a boy, I think it's in Pakistan. His passion is robotics, and he just watched 
uh, YouTube videos. And now he's making all these cool robotics. So it's just cool hearing your story that the passion started uh, so early that you didn't have many materials at the beginning, but it was still kind of fostered that love for the craft. You also mentioned uh, painting. So in terms of graph design compared to other art styles? I think the major difference would be that, well, these days I am a little more careful about the definition, but I'll explain what I think about it. For painting, I can, you know, like what you see behind me, let me see if you can see it. For painting, I could wake up and say, oh, I have this inspiration to you know, paint a woman and I would use these colors and, you know, because blue represents something to me. Everything is kind of subjective. Some things are subliminal. Some things are driven by emotion. And some things are just basically the urge to create. Whereas with graphic design, it's always aiming to resolve either a problem or bring forward a concept in a practical way. Graphic design would be, okay, we're building a new airport and we need signage. And part of graphic design is doing interior graphics, you know, where are things going to be placed optimally, where people would see them and how do they understand it and all that. So all of those do... Uh, come into play. So we use principles of mathematics, we use principles of visual communication, we use psychology principles, we use principles from, you know, just basic um, eye-hand interaction in some places. So graphic design brings all those things to the table to say, yes, this is the problem and we've got to resolve it. And It's a little bit different then from, say, painting or drawing where you're inspired to bring something out. People like it, they don't like it. It doesn't really matter. You know, you could do a painting and somebody loves it enough to pay 40 million for it. And somebody else would be like, what is this? You know, it's in the eyes of the beholder. But if you, in graphic design, do a sign that doesn't work, you could mislead people. I remember years ago going through one particular airport and I would not name the airport. There was renovations at the airport. We literally ended up at another terminal because of one wrongly placed arrow. And that was it. So graphic design uh, works with architects, engineers, interior designers, works for printers, works in almost every industry. In fact, design, that word design is at the core of everything. So it's just planning, it's executing. And it's more rigorous in the sense that you do have deadlines, you have things you must take into account, um, look at the interior of the space you're working with, you know, what colors are used there. Can it work on my sign? No, I want there to be contrast so people can see the sign against the background of the colors in the hallway um, long before um, gender neutral bathrooms where um, signage was required. I had already been giving my students exercises to come up with gender neutral signs. And it's very interesting to see the direction that each one is taking it based on what they knew. You know, so graphic design definitely is a more, um, I would say, practical on a regular basis um, form of art, if you will. But they're all related. These days you have art that looks like design and design that looks like art. Um, The lines are not quite straight and cut like before. Now we have all sorts of, you know, organic um, interactions between the two. So I wouldn't say one is better than the other, but definitely graphic design is, um, you know, it's more like a science, if you will. (laughs) No, that, that makes a lot of sense. You're working for an organization or a client. You have a specific you know, purpose that you have to you know, create for. But within those limitations, 
you can be like really creative. Uh, I think the same thing is in terms of um, writers or game developers. If they're given freedom, uh, when we're seeing a lot of cartoons or shows where they don't have any oversight or limitations, things go off the walls <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, when you have constraints and you're trying to be creative and flexible within it, it can really create something uh, really unique and, and, and cool. So you're, you're mentioning all about all these different aspects and these creative approaches to these projects and this almost scientific aspect to this particular form of art. What do you most enjoy about it? Well, that's, um, <laughs> you know, let me, let me just use an anecdote for answering that question because I was working on a project two months ago and having so much fun with it, I turned to someone and I said, please don't let them know how much I'm enjoying this or they might not pay me. <laughs> um, if you wake me up at night, there are some things that would quickly wake me up. If you said, hey, let's drive from Winnipeg to Saskatoon, I will be up. If you said, hey, a company needs a new logo by morning because it's super urgent, I will be at my computer within four minutes. But there are other things that you couldn't get me to move on. I'll just be like, well, you know, just forget it. <laughs> so I really enjoy doing the work, going through the process, looking for solution for each and every problem that I encounter along the way, doing the research, you know, and laying the foundation borrowing from all the knowledge of history that I know and knowledge of cultures that I know and bringing everything to the table. That's really just enjoyable. There's a Reddit page called r slash uh, bad designs and it just <laughs> focuses on all, like not just graphic design, but a whole lot of different aspects. And when, when something isn't thought about correctly, it can really... Uh go uh, haywire i think there's one it's a rotating sign but it's between two other signs but it's just kind of bouncing back and forth what would you say is the most challenging aspect of going from a, a concept when a client or the organization comes to like hey we need this to actually you know making it a reality i think there could be several things that would be challenging um it, it could be the designer themselves that don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Let's just get that out of the way. That happens. It's not um, always uh, a client's fault or the organization's fault. But sometimes the dynamics within an organization can set a project on the wrong direction. You know, if you have a very powerful person with a powerful opinion, uh, that could be a challenge. It could derail uh, the solution. <laughs> If you have someone who's knowledgeable to a point and they have a strong opinion about, let's say, even a color, that could be a major challenge. And it's just little things like that, you know, that could be a problem when you're working towards a solution. Um, some of them are easy to solve and some not so easy. So I would say it's the interaction with others, you know, even members of your own team, if they have specific knowledge about something and they're on yielding, you know, to get new information, um, that could be a challenge. So those are, it's just the human interaction area that proves to be challenging. And sometimes a client might have their own, um, what they call committee or board, and you don't know it. You sit with them, you explain things to them, and it's clear while you're doing that. But when they go to explain it to others, it's not using your words. And they're more, if they value the opinions of those people more than yours, um, you could be going around on a project for a long time. So those are some of the areas that I personally find challenging. Otherwise, it's a fun, you know. Yeah, it's almost like a, a game of telephone uh, sometimes where things can get lost in translation between uh, uh, different uh, people as it moves 
down the line. In terms of projects like that, you know, the challenging aspect, you know, that kind of pushes you to get creative and, you know, put a unique spin on things is incredibly fulfilling. Like you mentioned, um, you need a project last minute, you're like jumping on that uh, computer right away to get to it. So you, you have this massive passion for graphic design and art. When did you realize you wanted to, you know, also teach and, you know, become a lecturer? That's a, a very interesting question. Early on in my your journey to learning graphic design, you know, you have different kinds of teachers, different instructors. And I would say even from day one, I noticed the differences between the instructors. And I would always say at the back of my head, if I ever get to teach, I will do this. If I ever get to teach, I will not do this. So over the years, I've always sort of thought, you know, one day I might be in a position where I'll be teaching. And then that came in 2004, where the opportunity just showed up. And I'm like, wow, this is the time that I've <laughs> always wanted to have. Initially, it was shock. Initially, it was um, fear. And then, I, wait a minute. Finally, I found that, you know, I'm going to go in there and teach people the way that I have always wanted to be taught. And that was it for me. <laughs> that first moment going up to teach, it's almost like um, going on stage to perform, or at least that's the way I kind of uh, picture it when you're going out in front of students. It is. <laughs> it's <laughs> actually, um, it, it never goes away for me. You know, every first class in every semester or term, there's this worry or fear. It's like I'm meeting new students. Who are they going to be? What do they know? How can I enhance their lives? You know, how can I share knowledge with them? You know, and things like that. It, it never goes away. If you, I actually think it's a good thing because it keeps you on your toes as a teacher. Yeah. The other thing about teaching is if you are not engaged in the industry, and you're teaching, it's kind of like an abstract. Personally, I feel that every teacher should be actually engaged in the work itself so that you know what the current requirements would be, you know what, where the industry is going, you know what kinds of challenges are happening, and you actually can envision what's coming. You know, that's one of the ways that, you know, keeping up with the news alone was enough for me to start giving out assignments about gender neutrality um, long before it became a requirement. So those are the kinds of things that... That's a good approach to things, being aware of kind of the ecosystem of everything beforehand when you're starting to see those conversations because right now you know we're, we're seeing uh, 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 last year BLM and you know LGBTQS uh, rights with pride just recently happening you see a lot of these major corporations kind of hopping on the bandwagon like right at the end to be like oh look how woke we are come buy our products but yeah you you <laughs> if you want to actually you know be ahead of the curve you gotta pay attention to those ecosystems. Very much so. And, you know, we know the world is very different today. You know, people depend a lot on metrics, you know, how many things uh, people are clicking on, what's trending and so on and so forth. And that converts into sales or getting people to be aware of a product or, you know, whatever it is. Um, I think, I have a lot of opinion about those, but yes, the more visionary companies uh, are ahead of the game when it comes to social issues because they're actually engaged. Um, those who jump on band bandwagon later, um, you can tell when they're not authentic. And that's the word that I like to share with people all the time that authenticity is so important when you're going to 
you know, be part of any movement. You know, it may be just enough to just make a statement and leave it there, but when you start splashing all these symbols and slogans all over your website and it's not authentic, well, of course, so many people are outed, so many companies have been outed, you know, like, hey, you're saying Black Lives Matter, but hey, this is what you're doing in the background. So authenticity is at the heart of all of those things. And sometimes it has nothing to do with graphic design, but it has a lot to do with corporate design, the design of the corporation itself or a firm, what are their beliefs, what kind of social responsibility do they have, you know, and all those things. So we could go on and on about that for hours. <laughs> yeah, and I think a good example would be the Every Child Matters movement where you see people wearing uh, the shirts, uh, shirts going to uh, individuals to get the, the hashtag Every Child Matters to kind of stand together for these walks. And then you see a number of companies and then in the media you hear about, you know, people calling them out for trying to make a profit off of this, you know, movement. And yeah. It's that authenticity, you know, being ahead of the curve and helping out. I mean, it'd be a completely different story if they're like, hi, every purchase from these shirts goes to help this kind of organization or, uh, you know, cause, but, you know, trying to turn a profit for it. Not, not the coolest thing to, uh, not, <laughs> to not do. Not the coolest. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of sad that society has pro progressed to the point where society itself is on sale. Um, that's what I, if, if somebody gave me a grant and said, Hey, you don't do any work for the next six months, go write a book. I would write it. Society on sale is the book that I would write. And graphic designers have a huge responsibility as part of that. Um, what kind of knickknacks are you selling? How long are they going to last? Would they break down? You know, that they biodegradable. Is there a biodegradable solution to this thing that you're trying to help this company sell? You've got to ask all the right questions. Um, why are you getting on this bandwagon? Why do you want to sell T-shirts? And we see where some political parties, not in Canada so far, thankfully, uh, where some political parties would sell um, merchandise with current slogans and, you know, just to get an edge. Um, society has really got to be very careful. And maybe we start reining these things in before we lose everything where, you know, only money talks and nobody else has a voice. You know, those are some of the things that we really need to pay attention to. Graphic designers have a huge responsibility when it comes to this. Like with our, uh, the younger uh, generations, like Gen Zs and the ones coming up, they seem to have a really good uh, mind for for everything in terms of social media, um, social issues, and just kind of uh, marketing and bringing awareness to things. They seem to be really on lock uh, with everything. So I I'm, I'm feeling optimistic about how things will change as, you know, these younger generations are getting into the workforce but yeah like you mentioned slogans and societies on sale and we definitely need to be incredibly careful with that because it's an incredibly slip a uh, slippery slope it is a slippery slope um there are so many issues in society that we should be dealing with rather than get carried away with trending slogans there was no trending slogan at one time and we were able to come around campfires and resolve issues and say, hey, you know, my people were wrong. My ancestors were wrong. There was nobody spreading this around the world that makes it harder for people to sit down and actually resolve issues. So I hope we come back to a place where um, politics and corporations and institutions don't take everything away from society at the very basics. Um, well, like I say, designers have a responsibility when it comes to that, and we have to keep an eye on that ball. And hopefully other people involved in other parts of society keep their eyes on their balls too, so that we all are playing fairly on the field. What first attracted you? What first lit that spark to 
talk with communities and students about social issues? I think um, if we don't have society, we will not have design. It's as simple as that. And you also can design a more livable society, a society that's kinder, a society that's more empathic. And if we don't, you know, make conscious efforts, and that's where design comes to it again, you know, making a conscious effort to say, okay, this is what we want to see, and then start to move in that direction um, to a really just society, not one that's um, living on slogans all the time. You know, if we have a society where what concerns me concerns you, then when we come to the table, it will be like working on a team. You see, when we're working on a graphic design team, um, you are good with UX, I am good with typography, and this person is good with colors. We all come and we start talking, hey, we should use Helvetica now. Um, maybe we should keep it to the thinnest and then make the highlights bold and this and that. That would be the typographer speaking. And the UX person would be like, ah, you know, why don't we move the images a little to the bottom so they can read the text and the text reader can read it right away. And the person, you, you know, who's passionate about colors will say, hey, I know the colors that will give us the most contrast. So this is how we work on a team. But when it comes to today's society, we're moving in the direction of, oh, you did this. And we are suffering because of it. Of course, historically, yes. Of course, the truth is yes. But if we come to the table and say, this is the problem. How can we resolve it together? Then everyone brings their best ideas to the table rather than, you know, having a, you know, one part saying we are in charge and the other part saying we are the opposition. It doesn't help me as a designer to think of society like that at all. You know, where, can you imagine, can you imagine going to work today and in your mind, you know, when you get to work, there are people who are going to stand there and oppose every single thing you try to do. This is the kind of society we've built if it worked in the 1800s or 1700s, is it time to change that? Can we come to a different place now where the, you know, all the best come together to bring their best rather than every time you make a pronouncement and there are people opposing it and say, I think they're wrong. This is the nonsense they did before and they're doing it again. I would be sick. I would, I would actually be very sick if I'm an individual who has to be in government where there is this opposition that's waiting for me every day to shoot down everything that I say or do. So we have to come to a more just society where we have round tables, where we have circles, where we all come together with our best, where if you bring a problem to the table, I have to take as much interest in that problem as the ones that I bring to the table. We have to get there. We're always, there's always opposition and, and defense. It's always, everyone gets defensive. Everyone's trying to be like, my, my thought is my the thought. correct thought. Yeah, my, 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 my approach is the, the right way. But yeah, that more collaborative uh, approach to things is definitely what we need to continue to do because otherwise it's just going to keep going around and round and round in circles. And I, I hear complaints about that all the time in terms of government, that nothing seems to ever really get done. Nothing really get, gets done because of all the dynamics within. And the things that you don't think a priority get the priority because, you know, somebody is much louder about it. When I came into this country, and I try not to mention names, you know, not to embarrass anyone, I went into a First Nation community with a friend. You know, most of my friends when I first came were from First Nations and we went to a First Nations community. And the conditions that I saw there were alarming, you know, quite a surprise. Why should it still be the same today? That means the decision makers, wherever they are, whoever they are, 
are not taking that problem as if it is their own problem. So we've got to come to that place where any problem anywhere in our society is ours to solve. And therefore, we must all be um, involved. We must all engage. We can't hear the problem and say, oh, no, it's this people's problem or that people's problem, you know, those people's problem. No, it is our problem. Until we take ownership, it's not going to get solved. We're in the same car. And if the engine is not working well, it's not yeah. working well. You know, so those are some of the issues. Anyways, uh, coming back to graphic design, um, just kind of finishing up, what are some of the trends that you're currently uh, seeing? We, you know, we mentioned a little bit about, you know, the, maybe the slogans are maybe a bit too much in terms of, you know, corporations taking advantage of them. What positive changes or positive trends you're seeing and what advice would you give to new graph design students or people heading into the industry? What advice would you give them? Um, just looking in the rear view mirror and then looking ahead the road. <laughs> there are certain patterns that I see. Um, one pattern that is been there is we started out as artists and then we became commercial artists. And then we broke off into illustrators, graphic designers, and this and that. And then, of course, you know, graphic design broke off into web design. We still have graphic design on the side. And today, the work that a graphic designer does is got a new label, depending on where you are. And it's a UI UX designer, you know, however you say it. And we keep playing with these words, but the core of this that doesn't go away is design. So what do I see coming? If I could, I would learn some serious coding, not just read code and say, oh yeah, I see where the problem is, you know, change that tag. You know, that's about where I am. Mm -hmm. But any serious design student today that really wants to have longevity in the business, I believe they need to learn some code, whether it's Swift, <laughs> whether it's playing with you know, HTML. Um, you've got to have some knowledge of code and how it can help you in your work. I think we're going in that direction. But well, one of the beautiful things that I'm excited about for the future of design generally and UI UX is accessibility, where it doesn't matter what your visual impairment is, what your auditory impairments are, that you can access the same information as everyone else. You see, when we're talking about just societies, that is our own part of that society that we must maintain. Mm -hmm. And we've got to learn to use the tools to do that and know what the principles are. You know, when I had a, uh, an accident um, that stopped me from being able to see in one eye for quite a long time, I understood exactly why you couldn't use certain contrasts and sizes for text. So thankfully today, we can, you know, pinch and swipe and all sorts. And if you want to see closer, you can just zoom in, you know, and enlarge things. Of course, years ago when everything was static, everything was printed, um, you couldn't zoom in. So you have to have readable type for different visual um, equities. And you know, some people are um, have to have what we call large type books or large type print books, and others don't have to. But now we have to now migrate that kind of thinking into our designs, where we know that um, using light gray text on a white background will not work. And switching to night mode, what are the limitations? 
you know, and, you know, all these things are so important. So design, like I said before, is almost like doing math and science together um, because it's moving in a direction where it's getting more intense. It's not about you liking blue and using blue color for something. It's more about legibility. Is it readable? You know, how does this perform? Would this type expand with the page or not? You know, how do I want this thing to re respond? How do I want it to react? Now, the people who are using a lot of those principles right now, are people who are marketing stuff, they put things in places where you could accidentally click on it and then you have to see an ad or you have to interact with something before you can go to the next stage. Well, hopefully that would uh, migrate into thinking for a just society so that everyone can access information the same way before we all get brain implants. Yeah, <laughs> till then. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just so interesting th thinking about how, you know, society, those mindsets, accessibility for designs, but just in terms of, you know, technologies advancements, like just over the past couple of years, if you're looking back a, a decade, just how YouTube itself has changed. Like if you go back, you're like, this is what YouTube looked like 10 years ago. It is just a different different beast it's very different and it's kind of interesting you know we just to say this when the internet started and web pages were being created you could tell when a technical person created a page and when a designer was involved at that time designers had no knowledge of code the crossover or should i say um, synthesis happened very slowly and even way back then, we would be screaming, no, it's got to be a white background. If you read white on, um, if you read black ink on white paper, why does it have to be different on screen? You know, we used to fight those battles and then slowly we, we now have what everyone calls minimalist design. You know, you've taken off all the flaming logos and the rotating whatever and everything is cleaner you know so we're there now and then we're moving in another direction where you know some people think it's dark mode you know and we'll keep fighting these things you know when i say fight is talking about them discussing what are the pros what are the cons and why do you use this and why should this switch to that you know like we talk about these things so um that's it's really exciting, actually. <laughs> and I, I, I joke and I tell people when I'm 90, what I'm going to be doing in the seniors residence is I'll be writing little snippets of code to make their wheelchairs go faster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> things change so quickly and it's just it, it's it'll be interesting to see how things change and develop in terms of social media, AI, algorithms, and just when it, when a new technology, when it comes out, it's going to change everything again. So like you said, it's going to be interesting to see how things change. Uh, some things may change drastically. Some things, not so much, but it'll be interesting to see uh, nonetheless. <laughs> and technology is always going to... Um, make some decisions for us based on the capabilities that they bring. Um, so that's another area of discussion, but that's for another time. <laughs> if you have any stories you'd like us to share or communities we should highlight, leave a comment down below and subscribe to stay up to date with everything you Multicultural is doing. I'm Ryan Funk. This was You Talk and have yourself a good one.